So um, those who are in online, I've already introduced myself here, but my name is Thomas John. I'm a professor of social technical system design here at Loughborough University, but also co-chair for this ISD 12 local hub in, in Loughborough. Um, and uh, this is um, our first keynote. So, um, I mean, I'm, it's really great honor to and pleasure to introduce Emeritus Professor Michael Jackson as our keynote speaker. Um, actually, it's my first time to meet him in person, but I, I, um, I came to know of him when I was doing my PhD, I don't know, 20 more years ago. And uh, my PhD was about applying system thinking in healthcare. But then I was reviewing lots of uh, articles. But one of the, my colleagues um, uh, recommended highly uh, the book, this book actually. Um, this is an old book. Uh, this is called Systems Approach to Management, which Michael Jackson uh, published a while ago. At the time, I was confused about, I was reading about him on factors, system thinking, systems engineering, management ecology. It was really confusing, but this was the best overview at the time. And I didn't buy many books, but I purchased this book at the time. So thank you, my personal thank you to you. And also I believe that uh, Emeritus Professor Michael Jackson is one of the most cited system scientists. Um, recently I found one of the um, kind of LinkedIn uh, a message, uh, someone who I know in Cambridge uh, did a bit of a uh, literature review on system thinking and design thinking. And he, he showed the core citation map and in, in part of the system thinking side, there was a big kind of node. And Michael Jackson was one of the big nodes, along with John Sturman and Donella Meadows, which are well known also in system thinking. So his influence in the field has been huge. So it's really great honor to have him here. And then obviously as a chairperson for this lecture, I was did a bit of a homework to see actually to more about uh, uh, Michael Jackson. And what was personally surprising was that the fact that he studied PP in, in Oxford, politics and philosophy and economics. Probably some of you might know about that degree is well known for uh, the degree for running the country. But uh, as I'm doing systems research, and I feel that you know, politics and economics and also those philosophy is getting more importance. I'm, I'm an engineer by myself, but that is really good basis for, I guess, system science. And you know, he worked in civil service and he moved to academia and taught at several universities in Manchester, University of Warwick, and uh, University of Lincoln and Hope University. And he served as president of various system research society in the UK as well as internationally. And he was awarded OBE in 2011 for his service to higher education and business. So there are more to say about him, but I'll, I'll stop there. and. I have asked Michael to talk about 45 minutes. We'll have a time for Q&A in 15 minutes. So there is a Slido um, kind of a QR code on your table. So you can- the back of your badge. Yeah, back of your badge as well, but also online audience, there'll be a link on your uh, chat. Uh, so please feel free to uh, write comments or, or questions while you're listening to Kino. So, Without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Michael Jackson with a big round of applause. <laughs> oh, no, you don't need to so sorry. Uh, well, Thomas has really set me up there. I'm not sure I can live up to that uh, particular introduction, particularly the big node bit. Um, I'm, I'm uh, Mike Jackson, not Michael for obvious reasons, and um, I'm been very much as Thomas has suggested on the on the systems thinking side of the debate that that you're all having. Uh, studying systems ideas for probably about fifty years now, and and becoming. I suppose the professional training I had was at Lancaster University under, under Peter Checkland. So I'm very much on the systems thinking side. My knowledge of design thinking is much less. Um, the strand I'm most aware of is the strand that started in the, the Barclay bubble uh, with West Churchman and uh, was, has been carried forward by Harold Nelson, who I have kind of ongoing conversation with and 
uh, through his design way and, and Peter Jones through uh, de de design design journey. So that's the bit of um, design thinking that I have some uh, knowledge of. I don't know why the two uh, elements uh, don't talk more, uh, systems thinking and design thinking, but I noticed there was a fireside chat this afternoon, Ray and Thomas and Rebecca, is it? Uh, and so I'm sure that they will um, they they will tell us and, and solve whatever issues may may be about in that respect. <laughs> I was asked to talk about critical systems thinking, uh, which is the the type of system thinking I've been trying to develop and promote. Um, uh, and I will, however, try to relate it to the overall theme of RSD twelve, which is uh, entangled in complexity, uh, and also um, the the local theme. Uh, the synergies between the sciences. And so thank you, RSD12, and thank you, Lufba, for this invitation. I'll try to relate uh, what I do to these two main <laughs> themes. So starting in a fairly um, obvious place, I'm trying to, not moving on to. <laughs> Thank you. Starting in a, a fairly uh, obvious place, uh, the cliche is that we live in this VUCA world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and, and ambiguity. Uh, and it's that that gives rise to wicked problems, uh, the kind of problems that we, uh, we, we feel endangered by in the world as it is today. Uh, so let me say, just pick out a few things about complexity that are going to be relevant to my talk. Uh, uh, first of all, it, it's organized. So we're, we're not dealing with organized simplicity, which as you would find uh, in the solar system, the kind of thing that uh, Newton studied with his um, and invented the mathematics to study and has carried the scientific method forward. Nor, nor are we dealing uh, with, ra uh, with random complexity, the movement of molecules in, uh, in gases that... Um, statistics and probability theory can, can deal with. We're dealing with organized complexity. Uh, and this requires a different approach to the, uh, to the physical sciences. This point was made first by Warren Weaver, um, who was natural science director for the Rockefeller Foundation. So we need something complementary to the natural sciences when we're dealing with uh, organized complexity. Then we have the, uh, and these are of course things from RSD, 12, um, the, the forms of complexity, technological entanglements, natural entanglements, entanglements derived, derived from policy and power, so the human and the social aspects of it, uh, and foundational uh, en entanglements. Um, Multidimensional complexity, uh, in, in other words, uh, complexity at different levels. Uh, and that may suggest to us that we need different forms of uh, systems thinking to, to deal with these different multidimensional aspects of complexity. Uh, and thirdly, does I uh, draw your attention to Resch's distinction uh, between ontological and cognitive complexity, which I find particularly useful. Uh, ontological complexity being the complexity that you can attribute to what's there in the world. Uh, and cognitive complexity being the complexity that we bring because we have different ways of perceiving the world. So if you think about the uh, COVID pandemic, there were certain aspects of ontological complexity which drove it, uh, which are the nature of the virus, how that virus would transmit the virulence of the virus, things which you could potentially discover about it. Uh, but the way the pandemic developed also depended upon uh, the way that scientists and experts responded uh, to the disease, how they interpreted it, how politicians responded, looking at their broader political audiences, uh, and how people of different groups, different types, responded as well. So it's this mix of uh, ontological and cognitive complexity, uh, which... Uh, I think is mentioned in or alluded to in this in this foundational entanglements mentioned in RS12, RS312, uh, which uh, is another important feature. So how do we respond when we're entangled 
in complexity? Uh, how do we react to being entangled in complexity? And I want to make a distinction here, uh, drawing upon the work of Edgar Moran. And Moran says there are two ways of responding to uh, complexity of the type that we've just looked at. Uh, the first he calls a restricted complexity approach, uh, whereby we still seek to understand the nature of the system. Uh, we still believe that complex systems can be understood using computational uh, modeling techniques, such as hard system dynamicists might use to try and gain an understanding of the way a complex system works through its feedback and feed forward loops. Uh, and to understand whether it's capable of predicting and controlling uh, what's going to happen. Or from the Santa Fe Institute, a kind of thing that um, uh, agent-based modeling similarly tried to gain some sort of prediction uh, so that you can control the system better. Uh, and Moran makes the point uh, that this is within the epistemology of traditional science. You're, you're looking for hidden laws, uh, whether it's feedback loops, uh, the way that, that they're structured in a system, or it's um, the particular characteristics of agents, uh, which will enable you to uh, predict and control what the system is doing. And Moran makes the case that it's quite dangerous because, of course, if you believe you know how the system works, uh, then you're likely to try and engineer it, uh, believing that you have some sort of expertise or, or knowledge. Moran, as you'll have gathered by now, is much more in favour of what he calls a, a general complexity approach, a, a recognition that the whole system uh, is unknowable, uh, it's resistant to universal truths. And so the key problem is along the cognitive complexity dimension, in Moran's terms, it's epistemological, cognitive, paradigmatic. It's more to do with how we perceive uh, the world uh, than it is the world itself, because we cannot understand the whole world. And different ways of looking at it uh, involve different cognitive perceptions, different, different epistemological stances, different um, paradigms. So in this context, uh, Moran says, you're better to look at complexity in terms of general complexity. This requires complex knowing, which is all about self-observation, it's about the way we look at the world uh, rather than actually what we think we see in the world, of course, two are, uh, are intimately related. Uh, and similarly with um, uh, Lumen, Lumen 2, an important system to think of course, is very much into this second order observation. It's not so much sociologists and what they, uh, that we should be looking at, what they say about the world, we should be looking at the way that they're looking at the world in order that they can say certain things about the world. Because the way that they look at the world leads them to certain conclusions that can potentially lead to certain actions in the world. So that's all important. How are we looking at the world? How are we understanding it? How are we perceiving it? How are we acting in the world and on the basis of that? And what are the outcomes uh, because of that? That's the thing which we primarily uh, should be looking at in this sort of complex knowing or second order observation. I actually found um, <clears throat> just the other day a nice quote from uh, Whitehead, uh, which um, is still in my briefcase. Excuse me. I hope it is. <laughs> no, it's not. It's here somewhere. Great to come across this quote from uh, Alfred Law White Whitehead because um, captures much of, of what Mar Moran's saying. Uh, it was, this is from di his dialogues in 1953. What Whitehead, of course, uh, often uh, said to be the first process philosopher, and some, some say he's a pragmatist as well. He said, uh, Whitehead says, there are no whole truths, so you can't capture the whole system. All truths are half truths. You need to look at these different truths that people bring when they're observing the system. Uh, and it is trying to treat them as whole truths uh, that plays the devil. It's trying to treat partial truths as whole truths that plays the devil, because then you think you have some expert knowledge which you can use to manipulate and engineer uh, the system. Um, so how, uh, if we're going to follow this notion of complex uh, knowing, 
second order observation. Uh, how is it that um, we can find some adequate partial truths to use? We've got to be able to find some sort of universal truths to which we can understand the whole system, but we may be able to find some adequate partial truths. And I, I was taken on this journey, uh, this way forward, after I'd read um, Lakoff and Johnson's uh, book on metaphors. Uh, what they argue is that we as a human species have developed experiential gestalts, old ways of looking at the world through our experience, structured set of metaphors, metaphors that hang together, uh, suitable to our successful functioning as human beings in our physical and cultural environments. So we have experientially developed some partial truths which have served us well in responding to the environments in which we found ourselves, the natural environment as we evolved and the cultural environment as we began to uh, work together as human beings in, in, in groups and in, in societies. So one, once you accept that, that, that we, we sort of live according to a structured set of metaphors, you start to ask the question, well, which of these is, is adequate? What, what are they? What are these useful uh, ways of looking at the world? What, what are these adequate partial truths? And then I came, came across a book by um, Stephen Pepper, uh, World Hypotheses, uh, in which he sets out uh, four of these adequate partial truths, uh, which he believes has guided us as a human species throughout our history. Uh, and those are formism, related to the philosophy of Plato, I guess, looking for universal forms behind everything uh, that occurs. Mechanism, um, we all know, uh, came to the fore with, with, with the word Galileo, Newton, the scientific um, revolution, uh, tended to dominate all the forms of thinking. Contextualism, uh, the act in its context, which can be perceived in different ways by different people. Uh, and organicism, starting with Aristotle and Hegel's philosophy being typical. And Pepper puts a pattern on this and says, um, if you look at all the, the way philosophers have thought about the world, uh, you can dismiss certain ways they've thought about the world, dogmatism, animism, but these four world hypotheses do seem to, in his view, give us the key to things. And working with these four uh, adequate world hypotheses, we get some flicker of light and we'd be lost without them. None of them can support a claim to absolute truth, but they do represent, he says, successes of cognition, things that enable us as a human species to do well. They're the creative discoveries of many generations. If you track them through the history of philosophy, the way we come to construct them and improve them. Uh, and without them, we should have to walk pretty much in the dark. So they're useful uh, guiding world hypotheses or partial, partial truths. Now, Pepper is a good, a good philosopher, in my view, in terms of summarizing, summarizing the history of metaphysics and philosophy. He wasn't such a good a uh, social scientist and uh, think about social science uh, and these, I think that's reflected in his world hypotheses. So what I did was try to have a look at um, not just the world hypotheses, uh, but the history of social science, sociological paradigms, the history of images of organization, uh, Morgan's concept of different ways of looking at organizations which are proven useful, Systemic perspectives um, from the systems uh, tr tradition, and, and to try and find some, I would call to call them like systemic perspectives, which I believe have been useful to people in finding their way in the world. And these are the, these are the five systemic perspectives um, which seem to me to be uh, important and to underpin systems traditions, the variety of systems traditions that exist. So we have, drawing upon mechanism, we have the mechanical systemic perspective, 
which looks at the world in terms of goal seeking, input output uh, orientation, how can we fit the parts together so we get the best outputs in the transformation from the inputs we put in, control through feedback mechanisms. And if you do all that right, you get some beneficial emergent property, like a car, Aikoff's example of a car, parts put together, none of the bits themselves, the wheels or the engine can take you from A to B, but the emergent property of the car which can do that. There's an interrelationship systemic perspective, uh, very common in indigenous thinking, in quantum mechanics, but it's there central to systems thinking, uh, looks at multiple variables, the way they're interconnected, interacting positive and negative feedback loops, causes which can lag because they are going right through the system and occurring at different places. Um, then there's an organismic systemic perspective, uh, which looks at are the subsystems functioning well to keep the whole in existence? And is the whole, as an open system, able to survive in its environments? Is it agile, capable of adapting? Is it resilient in terms of uh, responding to environmental turbulence? Does it demonstrate anti-fragility? Taleb's terms coming back stronger if it's been buffeted by uh, its environment. And then there's responding to contextualism. There's the purposeful system, systemic perspective. Uh, in Vickers' terms, this takes seriously the notion that human systems are different. Bolding had a hierarchy of system complexity. And he said, once you get to level seven, then the image becomes important. We act not just on uh, the, the basis of reactions to external stimuli. Uh, we're not like that. We act in the world according to the images we've built of it over time, biologically conditioned, culturally conditioned, educationally impacted. And that, that affects the way we, we, we operate. And so we have to have a different kind of um, approach here uh, because we have different worldviews, different mental models that can lead us into conflict, that produce cultures which may be good for an organization or an entity or bad because it encourages groupthink, it's not challenged. Uh, and finally, from uh, clearly here from the, the social sciences, we have a societal environmental systemic perspective, uh, which asks all the time who is benefiting and who is marginalized or disadvantaged by current systemic uh, arrangements. And what damage are we doing to the environment? How are we impacting the sustainability of our relationships with the world and the planet in which we, in which we live? So, now this is um, this is good news. You you might think it's a fluke that there are five overall systemic perspectives, and we have five sets of systems methodologies that can correspond to those uh, five adequate uh, five adequate world hypotheses. What a fortunate thing to have happened. So looking at this, I, this is what I regard as the broad family of uh, systems thinking. We have engineering systems, uh, methodologies, Deming's work, of course, on processes called systems, which had an impact in, in the recovery of Japan and Japan taking the lead. The vanguard approach, drawing upon Deming, uh, and much used in local government in the UK and elsewhere, and uh, systems engineering. Uh, Deming's work and systems engineering, both initially arising from the Bell Telephone Laboratories in the, in the States, very much within the engineering uh, engineering tradition. Then corresponding to the interrelationships systems perspective, we have system dynamics. Forrester's work developed by Vanilla Meadows uh, and others, uh, which looks at um, the relationships, the causal relationships in systems, the way things interact and the way they also become uh, embedded in feedback and feed forward loops and produce system behavior, which is counterintuitive 
because of that complexity that arises from the causes under different loops. We have uh, organismic systems approaches. I call them here uh, living systems methodologies. These are approaches which concentrate most upon the way the parts need to be fitted together to function in order that the whole can be successful uh, and viable. And they worry about the relationships between the entity you're considering and its environment, adaptation, resilience, anti-fragility. Um, so through technical systems thinking and the viable system model, I would say, have that, that thing as a primary concern. The soft systems methodologies address the uh, purposeful systemic perspective, ACOF's interactive planning, Peter Checkland's uh, soft systems methodology, that was the school I was trained in, uh, the things that developed from churchmen's work in the systems tradition, strategic assumption surfacing and testing, and uh, the concern, I think, first put on the agenda by critical system thinking, uh, the emancipatory systems methodologies, which respond uh, to the societal concerns of groups being disadvantaged and laterally to environmental concerns, such as Ulrich's critical systems heuristics, and more recently, the gender, environment, marginalization framework of um, Ellen Lewis and, and Anne Stevens, the GEMS framework. So you, you've got what have proven to be adequate world hypotheses observed as well. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, systems methodology which correspond to each of those different world hypotheses. But it's not actually fortunate. Uh, you can provide a Darwinian explanation as um, as um, Vesha does when he's trying to explain this kind of thing, uh, which is it's inevitable if we're going to survive, the fact we survived as a human species must mean we have to some extent world hypotheses which are useful to us and enable us to survive. Uh, and it's not surprising, therefore, that we have methodologies, technologies that correspond and enable us to act in the world in ways in tune with the world hypotheses uh, we need in order to uh, in order to survive. Now, despite that explanation, there may be cynics. There may be people who question uh, this uh, way of thinking. And these are some of the questions they, uh, they might ask. Uh, why just five of each? Why five world hypotheses? Why five types of systems methodology? Well, all I can say is that new contenders put themselves on the same level as useful ways of viewing the world and acting in the world, would need to prove themselves as equally adequate in, uh, in, in, term, in uh, Pepper's terms. Will any perspective or methodology eventually prove itself the best? Uh, well, the big candidate for this, of course, is uh, was perhaps mechanism. With the uh, scientific revolution, uh, it looked as though all problems could be solved, as though the scientific method that was giving us a grasp of the physical sciences could be extended to the natural sciences, biology, and on to the social sciences. It looked to be a candidate for uh, being the one approach, the one methodology that could uh, do everything. But as has been pointed out, there are there are dangers, uh, there are dangers in, involved in this. Uh, the triumph of the scientific revolution has tended to put other ways of seeing the world uh, into, into the background, pushed it, pushed them away, pushed them into the background. And they're only just sort of re-emerging, I think. So there are real dangers if you take the scientific method as the potential, as providing the potential uh, to be just the one methodology uh, we need. We do seem to need the set uh, uh, of, of, of approaches. The work of Newton, uh, Galileo, um, uh, Bacon, and, and Descartes uh, triumphed in the scientific revolution, forced other ways of thinking out, and that's, but that became potentially dangerous. We'd reacted against, of course, by the romantics, and now we know 
some of the problems that arise when this approach becomes uh, dominant and pushes out, pushes out others. We tend to forgive people like uh, Galileo and Newton, the scientists. Uh, we don't like Descartes, do we? I bet nobody in this room likes Descartes. System thinkers don't like him because of his reductionism. Um, design thinkers don't like him because of his dualism. Nobody likes Descartes. There's another reason for, for not liking him. He wasn't very kind to animals. <laughs> and this is, the, this is the shift that happened in the 17th century. Uh, the shift from the sort of Renaissance humanism of, of um, Shakespeare and, and, and Montaigne, uh, who were amazed by the amazed by the world, saw its multifaceted characteristics, um, who thought, who lived in doubt. They didn't think they had uh, the answers. And suddenly we get Descartes looking for certainty and all kinds of explanations why this occurred. We needed certainty after the after the religious problems of the Thirty Years' War. Descartes looked as though he could bring that bring that certainty. But things followed in, in its wake. And let me give you a horrible example which perhaps illustrates it. Montaigne, if you've read his essays, was loved animals. He, he understood that there are different perspectives on the world. He, he engaged with cats particularly. Uh, he'd look at his cat and say, that cat's trying to understand me. This is I'm trying to understand that cat. It has a worldview. It has a, a way that it interacts with the world. Take Descartes. All animals are machines. Now close your eyes if you like animals, close your ears if you like animals, because Descartes used to conduct live experiments upon dogs, dissecting them. And he believed that the screams he heard were like the screeching of metal. All animals were reduced to machines. A huge shift in thinking uh, within perhaps about 50 years. Can the various perspectives be harmonized and amalgamated? Not really. They give you different ways of um, viewing the world and acting in the world. Why would you want to try and compress them? Um, they're good at different things. So if you have a screwdriver, you might be able to use it as a hammer uh, and a, or a saw, some sort of you must, but they're not going to, it's not going to be very good at it. Uh, even a Swiss army knife uh, is not really good at what all various things can do, a saw or, or a screwdriver or a bottle opener. But certainly we can improve these ways of seeing the world. Certainly we can enhance these systemic methodologies. And certainly we can understand the value of non-Western systems, traditions, and try and see what we can learn from those as well. So my answer to the first uh, dilemma, how do we... How do we um, uh, navigate our way through entangled complexity is to use these partial truths which have proven beneficial to us over time. Enhance them, use the systems methodologies that we have appropriately in combination if necessary uh, in order to find our way and navigate our way in untangling some of that complexity. The second question, Thomas, uh, I don't know who posed this in Loughborough, but how can we bring about synergies between uh, the sciences? Uh, there are two ways, it seems to me, of, of doing this. Uh, one has been tried for a long time. Uh, it comes through in Bogdanov's technology, a universal science of organization, in the search for general systems laws, in cybernetics to some extent, universal features of all systems in complexity theory of the Santa Fe time. I mean, if you look at the systems engineers, uh, they still have bodies, uh, research bodies, looking for these universal systems laws. You can see how it might help them if we could find them, because it means they could translate what they know in systems engineering to other domains, such as management or social, social policy. But then it's not going to happen. It's like waiting for Godot. You're never going to find these universal systems uh, systems laws. And you kid yourself if you think uh, if if you think you are because of emergence. 
as Bolding pointed out, different levels of complexity lead to different types of emergence. And when you get to the human level, working with mental models, you can't expect the same kinds of models of complexity to work, which work at the mechanical uh, level. Uh, and if you want an illustration of this, then you can find it in those that have tried to develop universal laws, general systems theory all but faded from view, cybernetics has divided itself into first order, second order, third order, as it's tried to come to grips with different forms of complexity. There are as many types of complexity as there are, uh, as there are social theories. Complexity theory has become totally promiscuous. It'll, it'll go to bed with any social theory it can find. <laughs> And it has to do it because it has to expand its range. You cannot have universal systems laws. A better way forward to me is through pragmatism. So the, the unity, the synergy between the sciences comes from what they're trying to achieve. The better future for us as a human species living on this planet in harmony while we maintain the sustainability of what's, of what's occurring. And if you look through the systems tradition, there's a lot of pragmatist stuff there. I would say the overwhelming orientation of systems thinking, if you forget about the general systems theorists, is pragmatism. You find that in, I've done a paper comparing Bogdanov's work to that of Pierce, James, uh, and Dewey. Von Bertalan feels a perspectivist uh, in his philosophy. Wiener reacted a bit about the notion of cybernetics as a universal science. You have British cybernetics giving up on the idea that the brain was something that tried to mirror the world. The brain is actually something that tries to help us to cope in the world. Uh, therefore, you can learn about the brain from constructing adaptive machines. Beard's viable system model pickering would, uh, would argue is something that you build an organization on, but then you let it evolve with its environment, a dance of agency, finding out what it can learn from its environment and what is capable of, and the environment finding out what the system's capable of at the same time. Uh, Pickering link, links it to James's pragmatism. Soft systems methodologies, of course, this trend, the Barclay bubble, um, uh, was directly linked to American pragmatism. Uh, Singer was a, a, a pupil of James's. Churchman was a pupil of uh, Singer. Zakoff was a pupil of Churchman. Vickers was involved in the Barclay bu bubble. He influenced Checkland, as did Bolding, uh, uh, of course, with his level seven um, uh, mental model form of thinking. And a, a similar tradition for pragmatist tradition for emancipatory systems methodologies uh, stemming from Churchman and through the work of Ulrich. This is what I see as the heart of pragmatism on which we can unite um, the various strands of the systems movement and systems thinking and design thinking. We reject the spectator theory of truth, uh, that whole thing which dominated Western philosophy from the time of Plato. Let's get beyond the reflections on the wall of the cave to the real truth. And Descartes with his attempt to gain certainty about the world. Let's forget that it's misled Western philosophy, taking it down a blind alley. Uh, there are no universal truths, fallibilism. Uh, truths are, we can, we can act according to what we believe to be the truth now and see where it takes us, see if it pays off uh, uh, in the world. But it comes about, truth comes about through a community of, uh, of really involved of practitioners um, uh, ratifying it and saying it's the truth. But beliefs can still be evaluated according to their consequences. So we're not left in the realm of relativism. Uh, we can still see whether these beliefs, whether the adequate world hypotheses, if you like, uh, take us anywhere, uh, work with them. What good do they bring us? How do they operate in the world to uh, improve things? Uh, putting those two together, Putnam, one of the key commentators on pragmatism, writes, that one can be both fallibilistic, not believing universal truths, and anti-skeptical, we don't have to be relativistic, is perhaps the basic insight of American pragmatism. 
Incidentally, uh, Putnam was influenced by churchmen as well. I didn't know that, but he was much influenced by churchmen. James, reality is a multiverse giving rise to multiple truths. And theory is not as attempts to mirror the world. Uh, uh, Rorty's book, of course, important him bringing this idea across from the original pragmatists. Uh, theory is not as attempts to mirror the world, but as instruments of action, which we test out uh, in action. Now, if you set, accept pragmatism uh, as a way forward for systems thinking uh, and design, these, I would argue, are the benefits that we start to reap. First of all, the systems tradition is divided. Parts of it don't speak to, uh, don't speak to uh, other parts. The, there's those who try to keep it very much in the close family. There's a presentation out there by the Royal Academy of Engineers. They like to keep systems thinking in the close family. They should seek to extend their way of thinking a bit more to some of these other systems traditions. They need to stop talking in terms of problems and solutions. That's not the world we're in today. Let's look at this broader range of the extended family of systems traditions. And pragmatism can bring these things, uh, can bring these things uh, to, to, together, give us more unity uh, of, uh, of purpose. If you look at Taoism or Confucianism, they've got pragmatist roots. If you look at young Kapoor's sand talk or Good Child's relational systems thinking from the indigenous traditions, they've got pragmatist ways of thinking. It will help extend the dialogue to Eastern and indigenous traditions of systems thinking, help the engagement with those. If we accept pragmatism and see systems thinking as a form of pragmatism, we can engage more fully and have greater influence on contemporary debates in philosophy, uh, social theory, and social change. Systems thinking tends to be a thing on itself, not taken seriously by social scientists, people in other disciplines. We can engage in those debates properly if we know what our philosophy is, because, as Bernstein says, important conclusions in 20th century philosophy can be understood as variations on pragma pragmatic themes. It's that way of thinking which dominates those debates. Actually, also the debates that stem from the work of Heidegger and Wittgenstein. You can relate to those. And what can we contribute? We can learn from them. What can we contribute? We'll try reading some of the pragmatist books by Misak or Bernstein or Putnam or Rorty. Uh, they move away from the original intention of pragmatism, uh, which was to get down to helping the everyday practical concerns of men and women. Pragmatism, despite its initial hopes, has become too philosophical for its own good. We can help it return through our systems approaches, systems methodologies, to help with everyday practical concerns of men and women. So this is the final slide doing well thomas you start me five minutes late so i'll finish three minutes late uh so what has critical systems thinking achieved in the 40 years of its existence this was uh it's provided i think a critique of the variety of systems approaches and methodologies uh, what their strengths are how they engage with the world and where they're successful engaging with the world but also their limitations they all have limitations. You can't understand the whole system. So any attempt to address it and, uh, and change it is going to be partial. It's made a strong case for a pluralistic approach in systems thinking, multi-perspectival through the various uh, world hypotheses or systemic perspectives, a multi-methodological for using methodologies appropriately, don't think that one can do everything, and in combination uh, if necessary. That, I think, enhances the practical orientation of systems thinking uh, by, and we've done reflecting in critical systems thinking, how you can do multi-methodological interventions. Um, <clears throat> we've raised and kept to the four um, issues. I think critical systems thinking, as I say, uh, was the first to say, well, soft system thinking doesn't really deal with these issues of power, marginalization, disadvantage. So we brought that to the fore in critical systems thinking. 
Uh, and that's important. It remains to the fore. You shouldn't conduct any study without that being one of the world's hypotheses or systemic perspectives that is clear, present in your mind and always informing what you do. And recently, the environmental concerns uh, have become foremost as well in systems thinking. And finally, I think, uh, it's found a philosophy, pragmatism, uh, which can potentially unite the various strands of systems, think of, of systems thinking, help us to engage as well with contemporary debates in philosophy, social science, and social change. So that, well, that's what I think critical systems thinking has achieved since it was founded in the early 1980s. The case I'm making uh, is that this enables us, this gives us insight in how we need to deal with being entangled in complexity through the use of useful partial truths and the ways of acting associated with them. And it gives us insight uh, into how we need to achieve a synergy between the sciences, not by abolishing their differences, uh, not by saying the same laws apply in all the sciences, but by looking at the purpose served by those sciences, which is improving uh, the human condition, the state of life on Earth for all members of the human species living on this planet in harmony and sustaining the planet itself so that it can, uh, we can keep living in it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So many things we can take away. But uh, I have some question here, uh, which already... Uh, the title, cool. yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm the one who suggests this synergy between science in the, the local hub. So I think, um, uh, in a way, uh, in those entanglement is one of the topic, and then we have to understand entangled complexity by entangling each other. But entangling each other means that we have a different views, different disciplinary backgrounds, and then it's important to be, in a way, kind and then also encouraging to each other. So one of the questions here, I'll start with, um, I don't know whether this is Ray's question, but um, it's about uh, how do we build and co-create system sensibility? Uh, how um, uh, complex in the way? Uh, co uh, it probably it means that okay, this is is that your question? I know. <laughs> well, it says that they they call it um, complexity in the way. My understanding of this question is that okay, uh, it's not just some of the individual who know this kind of stuff. It's collectively we have a better system awareness and this kind of understanding about how different views and things like that. So uh, if I'm correct, then the question is how do we uh, build, co-create systems sensibility? Uh, uh, that was the question. Is that something you can uh, We have to co-create it as, a, as the question is implying. Um, I'd like to take that in a particular direction. I'm not sure it's what was implied by the question. Um, that direction to say, why is there not more systemic sensibility about the place? Um, uh, which there should be. Uh, and, and it's clearly because of the dominance that mechanism has had, uh, and, and people still default to the mechanistic way of thinking. Uh, with the scientific revolution, the success of the scientific revolution, it tended to replace other modes of thought, became the dominant mode of thought. And to an extent, we're still living with that although other ways of thinking are starting to come forward again. People are looking more organismic aspects of the world, thinking of it that way. Uh, uh, the, the pe people looking at the environmental issues, uh, again, all the things that were kept alive by the romantics, but in the background when uh, the scientific method and the technology it produced and the industrial revolution carried all that stuff forward. Now, uh, the other side of why there's not more systemic thinking about is that it's not taught anywhere, really. Um, universities are divided into uh, particular disciplines. Individuals gain their advancement by uh, publishing in particular disciplines. Interdisciplinary work, despite all the, uh, all the words that are said about it, is still... Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's still infrequent. Transdisciplinary work, where are the systems groupings in, in universities these days? Um, they're struggling for the, for the most part. At the time when, more than anything, 
uh, we need an alternative way of viewing the world, different perspectives on the world to come to the fore again because of the dangers we're put in by the dominance of the scientific, science, scientific method. Uh, we, have no, we have nothing where people are being taught these, these alternatives. Yeah. It's an educational issue, but a hard one to crack. Okay. Good. I, I, I think we'll touch on that topic with the uh, fireside conversation later, uh, but that's really helpful. Um, but I mean, I, probably this is a more personal question rather than here. Um, I was talking to Ray uh, this morning that as a system thinkers, we can be more frustrated by what's going on around, around the world or because we see some of the bad decisions made by you know some people. But how do you cope with that frustration yourself then, you know, as a you know, system thinker? <laughs> I'm, I suppose I'm bloody stubborn. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we, we all are, have doubts. I'm, uh, it, it's, it, well, I'll answer it in a personal way. It's given me a life. Um, I, I started thinking in a system as well as at school, I feel. You know, people, they were trying to teach me regional geography. You divide your country up and look away. I thought, something wrong with this regional geography. You know, what about the, the country? What about the economic sectors that it's involved in? Uh, and then I got interested um, in systems thinking at university through sociology, uh, through Marx and uh, systemic thinkers of, of that time, then did my Czechland stuff. Um, uh, and so then became, eventually, I'm glad I worked before I became an academic, but I did become an academic. And so it gave me a life in that respect as well, <laughs> gave me some income um, as an academic and a, and a consultant. Um, and I never lost will. I never lost faith in it. Uh, and now, as I get older, it gives me a way of looking at my role, and my place in the world as well. Okay. Uh, to philosophers such as uh, uh, systemic philosophers such as Spinoza, I can quietly move towards my end, thinking in systems terms as well. So it's carried me through this life, and I'm stubborn about it. Writing another book now. And sometimes I have doubts when I'm writing it, but I have to plow on. I have to try to plow on to make the points. Yeah. You've got to be. You've got to be bloody stubborn to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, there are um, quite a few questions coming up. So um, probably this is also quite interesting question about. I mean, as a, probably there are these people with a design background. We we like more practical things. You suggest something there about pragmatism, um, but I guess one of the question here is that. Um, what would you say this means for decision makers in an increasingly complex world? How do you make this even more practical or actionable? Uh, to them? Well, I, I, I kept away from the practical, actionable stuff uh, for the reason that the previous question was alluding to. Um, using systems ideas properly it does require shifts in thinking, shifts in, in, in mindset in order to use the particular systems methodologies and the systems tools appropriately. So I've been trying to talk about a shift in mindset, really, in what I've done uh, this morning. But there are tools which enable us to reinforce those particular mindsets, which I think need to come to the fore again in a sort of second enlightenment, the first enlightenment having been taken over by the scientific method. We need a, a new radical enlightenment, as it as it's called, where these other ways of thinking uh, are brought to the fore again. And we do have practical tools which can help us with that. Of course, what I present in many ways is an overview and an ideal type. And in actual intervention, um, what I'm presenting is something that you can reflect upon uh, in, in thinking about how you're constrained in a particular intervention to think in all these ways and to use this range of tools. You're never going to be able to do critical systems thinking perfectly, uh, that's ridiculous and, and it's wrong to try. Uh, you engage with the world as it is, with these ideas in, in your head, with these approaches available to you, and you see, and through co-creation, you see what's possible in the situation you find yourselves yourself in, reflecting, using this kind of ideal type upon where you're doing well and where you're falling short. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I mean, I also personally see many tools designed for system thinking used in a very linear way. So at your point about having mindset right means that you can use tool in a way it is intended. But I often see that 
you know, good tool, but can be used for quite linear way, but also the tool for linear thinking can be used for quite system thinking if you have a system mindset. So it's not about tool, but mindset is often very important, but actually the also tool is important to, to make it more practical. Um, it's, it's hard to, I'd agree with that to some extent, but it's hard to use uh, all the, all the tools tend to, I like to think of them as having specific assumptions built into them. Uh, and, and so you lose, you lose the force of the tool if you try and spread it too much in a Swiss army knife thing. I, I'd rather have a, a saw, a bottle opener and, and, and a knife and the other aspects of the Swiss army knife available to me rather than try and do everything with the one, uh, with, with, with the one tool. Mm -hmm. Can you take one? Okay, I'm ready. Have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I was going to ask you if you had any reflections on your consultancy practice, which you mentioned, and anything to this audience you would say exemplified what might be a designerly approach to acting your systems. Um, so just let, let me repeat the question for the online audience. So the question, I'm not sure I can do it, but I think based on his consultancy uh, experience, then what is the example of the designery way of approaching yeah, those uh, uh, kind of system thinking? Yeah. Well, Thomas's question is much easier to make. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer that one. Um, different question. I, I don't see the difference, really. I, I think one of the problems with with systems thinking is that I don't know where, but it became orientated to problem solving. You now people start talking about systems approaches that it's all about problem solving. Maybe you can blame, blame Peter Checkland a bit for that. Um, I don't see it that way. Uh, to me, systems thinking is, uh, is addressing a situation that's of concern or it's of interest to you uh, and trying to design uh, things in a way, things better. You know, bringing about improvements in that situation, design something better than than we uh, actually actually have now, and that's what I, I when I've been engaged either through my work life or through consultancy, that's what I've always tried to do: design something better, improve something uh, more than um, than it is when I inherited it or, or came came across it for the first time, and. I mean, my big experience, obviously, was uh, being dean of the business school at Hull. And I, and I raised that because I'm quite proud of it for this reason, that it wasn't just a one-off consultancy engagement. I didn't go in and go away again. Um, uh, it, it was over a prolonged period of time. And I used systems approaches in a design mode right throughout the 12 years when I was dean. Partial systems approach is trying to improve the efficiency of the uh, of the business school, so it gave a better return to the university, which potentially might reinvest back in the business school, uh, so that it would be structured to correspond to the world in which it which it faced. It learned it way its way to what kind of business school it could become. Just testing fire alarm testing. Sorry, all we'll go on, go off. Yeah, that's right. To try and put in place participative processes whereby people could feel engaged and part of decision making in the business school, looking through the lens, the emancipatory systems perspective all the time. What were we doing for uh, people of different sexual orientation? What were we doing for people who were disadvantaged in Hull? Uh, what were what was the percentage of women in senior positions in the in the business school? What were the interactions between different parts of things I was managing? too many uh, excellent researchers and nobody's there to teach the students. So you can draw your causal loop diagrams around, around those kinds of things. So bringing to bear all these partial truths and gradually learning uh, our way to getting the business school to be better uh, than it was when it, when it began was for me a designing experience uh, on one which uh, I'd like to think was relatively successful. We ended up as a triple crowned Triple Crown Business School with 185 staff. We started with nothing with about 25 staff. Good, thank you. Uh, just one last question from online. Um, so many people claim to be system thinker. What does it mean to be a system thinker? How do you get better at it? And how do you get more of it? Um, I mean, you talked about this for 45 minutes, but I guess <laughs> is that something you can add on? Yeah, there? Well, I will do it, but it might sound grumpy. 
uh, that there are a lot of people that that use the system's language these days. It, it, it's popular. Um, people like to use the word we're being systemic or, or, or we're being uh, holistic. Um, but the, 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 they don't have the, uh, the background in systems thinking or the knowledge of the history of systems thinking, uh, which I think they would need uh, in order to, not to just gradually reinvent the wheel. Uh, you can see the wheel being reinvented all the time. I, I think you, socio-technical systems thinking, I mean, what a fantastic tradition of thought, but that suddenly almost disappears from view and people are bringing up again many of the aspects of socio-technical thinking as important ideas within the systems approach. If they knew the history, uh, they wouldn't start from scratch reinventing the wheel, they would start from somewhere, uh, somewhere positive. So it irritates me, it, it irritates me that people throw around the systems language with the potential for discrediting systems thinking as well, without knowing anything about uh, the history of it and what it's uh, genuinely and really about. And we don't seem to be getting any closer to addressing that problem, establishing uh, systems uh, groupings in the university, which can play an important part in, in giving people the background they need to be able to say they're proper systems thinkers, uh, and take take the transdiscipline forward. There's some progress uh, with the systems thinking apprenticeship, which uh, Ray was heavily involved in designing, or what was at the Open University, Exeter, Birmingham, et cetera, about seven or eight probably more providers now. Uh, but not enough. We need well-established departments in universities who can understand the history, teach systems thinking as a complement to those departments which are doing their own thing in the sciences or arts or whatever uh, and take the transdiscipline forward without having to reinvent the wheel and without not knowing what the what should already be within their understanding thank you thank you very much that's why we invited you to, to teach us about history of the system thinking so let's uh, finish with a big round of applause and then uh, So thank you, online audience. We are finishing this uh, keynote lecture. We'll come back at uh, uh, is that uh, yeah one forty five or one forty. So it's a lunch time. Lunch will be served in a restaurant over there. So there's a kind of buffet cafeteria. So you can choose what you want there. Uh, so please come back at one forty. Right? Okay. Thank you. Oops.